Okay, so I'm gonna talk about another kind of active research area which could be a interesting subject for a project. Um, and this is the area of unsupervised word translation. Uh, so what does unsupervised word translation mean? Well, basically the idea is, can I train a machine learning model to translate to and from a language that I know nothing about? Or to put it another way, if I have, let's say, uh, a whole bunch of English text and a whole bunch of French text, uh, can I train a model to translate between English and French without any kind of a dictionary matching English words to French words or any cross-lingual information at all? All I have is English text and French text and not, no information to, to connect the two. And so this may seem like a pretty daunting problem. It's one that uh, may not even seem possible for a machine to solve, but we as humans solve it all the time. Whenever you know, we learn new languages, especially as, as children, um, and so it is one that we should be able to solve. And as it turns out, we actually can. Um, and the a big example of this, uh, the kind of the seminal uh, work in this area, was uh, a model called MUSE, which stands for Multilingual Unsupervised Word Embeddings. And that was published by Facebook AI Research near the end of 2017 or the beginning of 2018. Um, so has anybody heard of this model before? No? OK, that's fine. Um, and so MUSE can indeed learn to translate between languages without any cross-lingual information. And it achieves state-of-the-art accuracy on you know, hundreds of, of languages. Uh, it even actually comes pretty close to uh, supervised models. Uh, do you guys know what the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning is? Yeah, OK, good. Um, so uh, how does MUSE work? Well, the basic uh, elementary approach to it relies on a concept known as word embeddings. Um, and so word embeddings are a pretty foundational part of natural language processing nowadays. Um, and the idea behind a word embedding is that you know, if I am going to have some kind of model that operates on language and I want it to, to operate on words, well, I need to find a way to turn those words into vectors that can become a part of my model. And the naive way to do this, perhaps, would be to look at them as one hot vector. So for example, if I have a dictionary of 50,000 English words, I assign a unique index to each of my words, and I say I represent a word by a 50,000 dimensional vector with a one in the spot of its unique index and a zero everywhere else. And that's known as a one hot representation. Um, this is obviously not optimal for a number of reasons. Um, and so instead, we, we say is, let's try to reduce this, this space. So instead of being 50,000 dimensional, we can say maybe 300 dimensional. And let's learn a 300 dimensional vector to represent every word in the English language. Um, and we want to do this in a way such that you know, somehow these vectors capture something about the words. And somehow there's some kind of information that's learned here about you know, which words occur together, which words occur separately, and that we can use this somehow uh, as a, a useful framework for thinking about words and using, and models that, uh, using models that are based on words. And so the most famous example of this is a model called WordDevec uh, in 2013. Uh, has everybody, who, who here has heard of WordDevec? OK, so a decent number of you. Yeah, it's pretty famous. Um, and, and their kind of example of how uh, their model works is, is the, the one that's talked about a lot, is if you look at the vectors for the words king, man, woman, and queen, if you take the vector for the word king, subtract the ve vector for the word man, and add the vector for the word woman, you get approximately the vector for the word queen, which shows that these embedding spaces are somehow you know, capturing something fundamental about how these words relate to each other. And this is exactly what we want. Um, so we can leverage this to do translation. And the idea is, you know, if we want to translate between two languages in a fully unsupervised way, we have to kind of hypothesize that there's some underlying structure connecting the languages. And we are going to uh, you do that using word embeddings. So we're going to assume that if I create a set of word embeddings on English and I, and I have a set of word embeddings on French, that somehow the vector space that I get uh, in each of these languages, these two vector spaces are connected somehow. And there's some kind of underlying structure that they share. Um, and so they use a very simple hypothesis, actually. Uh, the hypothesis that their paper uses, and it's a very important one, is that if I take uh, a vector from my English word embedding space and I apply just a linear transformation, a matrix, then I can get a translation to my French uh, embedding space. And this is actually quite remarkable. You know, that, that it's only a very simple transformation like this can transform between uh, English and French or English and, and German or any, any languages you want, uh, embedding spaces. And this actually works, and it does. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to learn some matrix W here. Um, 
such that this matrix in some way translates between these embedding spaces. And, and formally what we mean by that is if I take this matrix and I apply it to a whole bunch of my vectors from my English space, and then I compare those whole bunch of vectors from my English space transformed to the French space by my matrix, I compare that to my actual vectors from my French space, I want the distribution of vectors to be the same. And that might be a bit difficult to understand, so I'm going to try and show a, a diagram that might help a little bit. This is from their paper. And so if we imagine this is kind of the space of uh, English words embedded into this embedding space, and this is the space of Italian words embedded into this embedding space. We hope that there's a similar structure with them both having this, for example, a U shape. This is obviously highly simplified. You know, this is only in two dimensions, and really when we're talking about this, we're dealing with 300 dimensions. But this kind of uh, helps get the idea across, I hope. Um, that basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a, a transformation we can apply to this whole space X to make it coincident with our space Y. And by doing this, we can achieve translations. Um, and so does this work? Well, yes, it does. Um, and how do we do it? We, oh, yes, I, I forgot. So we, we actually need to, to figure out how we do this somehow, how we train our model to do it. And, and for that, we use a, a GAN. Uh, so GANs are a type of model you're going to learn about in a little while. Um, they stand for generative adversarial networks. And the idea of a general ad generative adversarial network, I'm not going to go into to great detail, um, but is that you have two models, a discriminator and a generator. And these two models are opposed to each other. In this case, our generator is our matrix. You know, we, our generator takes a, a vector from our source space and gives us a vector in our target space, or a bunch of vectors in our target space from a bunch of vectors in our source space. And our discriminator learns to tell whether uh, a set of vectors it's given is from, for example, our French vectors or from our transformed English vectors. It tries to tell whether we're giving it real French data or the, the data that's approximating French generated by our model. And so these two models train against each other uh, with the discriminator, or the, with the generator trying to fool the discriminator and the discriminator trying to learn whether it's the generator or the true data that it's seeing. And in order, by doing this, we, we learn uh, essentially a way to map these two distributions to the same space. Um, and so the results we get, uh, I can show you some here. Um, this is all in percent accuracy. So uh, I think it's important to kind of take a moment to think about this. You know, like if, if this is a model that, that's learning only on English data and French data with no cross-lingual information, and it achieves 82.3% accuracy in terms of word-by-word -word translations, that's incredible. That's unbelievable. Um, and you can see it, it does this on all sorts of languages. Um, now, if you want to turn this into an original research problem, here is where uh, there's sort of an interesting opportunity. Because if you look at this table, you see there's a whole bunch of entries missing. And those are languages on which this model didn't converge, um, so we were, where it was not able to learn translations. So for example, English to Farsi, English to Hindi, uh, English to Japanese, English to Vietnamese. Um, these are all languages where this model did not converge. Um, and a big open area of research is extending these sorts of techniques, because there's, there's plenty of papers based on, on Muse and Broz and all sorts of variants to its techniques, um, to languages that are either highly distant from each other or languages in which we do not have a, a large quantity of text available, low resource languages, where unlike English, I can't just go to Wikipedia and take a dump of it and get you know, 20 billion sentences to train my model on. Um, and so these are open areas of research that are quite hot right now and would be interesting uh, places for you to, to, to think about trying to do a project. Um, like uh, Mike mentioned, all Muse's code is available on their GitHub repository online. They also have trained sets of embeddings for something like 200 languages that you can download for free. Um, and so this is a, a, nice, a nice model to work with um, if uh, you're interested in doing that as a project. And feel free to come uh, and ask me any questions you have afterwards if you'd like.